Welcome to the Messenger broadcast, I mean telecast. I'm Pastor Banks, your host. Glad that you're joining us again to get into the book of Revelation. We are currently studying the book of Revelation and we left off in chapter 18 of, I mean chapter 1, verse 18 in the book of Revelation. If you would turn there with me and let's get into the word of God. Let's say a prayer first. Father, bless us as we study your word. Give us wisdom and understanding and grow our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for, uh, for joining us again. And we were on verse 18 where John had just encountered Christ, exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and Christ had come to him to reveal some things to him. And he wanted him to record it in the book, what he was showing him. And so in verse 18, as he had just fallen out in verse 17, as he was dead in the presence of Christ. And now Christ lays his hand on him and he gives him strength to stand. He laid his right hand upon him saying, fear not. I am the first and the last. And in verse 18, as we pick up this study, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. And he says, I have the keys of hell and of death. The keys of hell and of death. He says, I have those keys. Amen. Of hell and of death. The keys represent authority. He has the authority. He has the power over hell and death. He has the authority over this. He has the keys, they signify the power and the authority that Christ has. Amen. And in verse 19, he says, write these things which thou seest. Listen to the instruction that our master gives John. And by the way, this, is, this series here is entitled, The Message from the Master. He says in verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. He says to him to write these things. Now John is commanded to write. Now in verse 11, he was told to write what, was, what he was about to see. That's what he was told. And now he's told to write what he has already seen in the vision of, of uh, verses 16 to 18. Now, the threefold keys to the book of Revelation to understanding this is, number one, write these things which thou hast seen, that is, the vision of Christ and in the midst of the golden candlesticks, because that's the first thing he saw. And then, secondly, write the things which are, and that is the things concerning the churches, because now John is to write what the Lord God is going to show him about the churches. And this is one of the things we really want to focus in on in this telecast. The seven letters to the seven churches. Now, he's going to, to, to focus in on that. We're going to focus in on that as we go along. And the third thing is this. He's going to write the things which shall be hereafter. And that is the events that must come after the church. So we can kind of determine whether the church is going through the tribulation or not through the things that are written here in the book of Revelation. And we'll get a little deeper into that as we come to that. Because I believe there's going to be a rapture of the church. First Thessalonians tells us about that. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, them which are asleep shall God bring with him. For we say this unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I come to tell you something today in this messenger telecast that your greatest blessing is not going to heaven. Your greatest blessing is not material things. The greatest blessing is not becoming a king or a priest, but your greatest blessing that God will bestow on you for all eternity is to be with Jesus. That's your greatest blessing. Because where the Lord is, in the presence of the Lord, there's the fullness of joy on his right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's where we want to be, right in his presence. So he says right here, he says, I want you to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will be hereafter. So he's saying, write the things you see that I'm showing you now. Write the things that are going to, that, 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 that which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And that's what we're going to be dealing with here. In chapter, in verse 20, we're still in chapter 1, the mystery, now we're going to get a little interpretation about what some things mean, and it's going to be said very plainly, because the book of Revelation is what? The unveiling. It's the pulling back of the curtain so you can see in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. Because remember, John said this a little earlier, that I saw the Lord, and in his right hand he had these seven stars. Well, it tells you plainly right here in verse 20 what those represent. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, when you say angel, you can be talking about an angelic created being, or you can be talking about a messenger a pastor, a elder, someone in leadership, a messenger of God. And in this case, what he's talking about are the pastors and the leaders of the church. So in other words, you can say this, that as Jesus tells John about the mystery of this, the, the, this that he saw, he tells him, he says, write it to the pastors, write it to the church, write it to the leadership. I want you to record this and send it to them. And of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks, he says, which thou saw are the seven churches. So what John saw when he turned around, he saw these candlesticks. So that represented the church. But he also saw the Lord, and the Lord had in his hand those seven stars, which represents the leadership. God says the leadership is in my hands, and I am right in the midst of the church, which is represented by the, by the candlesticks. And I hope you're following along with me because now we get into something a little bit different because now we're going to see what the message from the master is. What is God saying to the church? You know, there's a lot of controversy in some places about what God thinks about the church, what the founder of the church thinks about the church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Remember, he asked the question, who do men say I am? And they had various answers to that question. And Peter said, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed art thou, for flesh and blood has not re revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And that's when the Lord said, upon this rock, not upon Peter, but upon the authority of what he said, upon the fact that he said, you are the Christ, upon that authority, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the church belongs to the Lord. That's the first thing we need to understand. And now we're going to see God's view of the church. If you want to know what God thinks of the church, if you want to know what God thinks of the activity going on in the church, the things that are happening in the church, what the churches are believing, what the churches are doing, in this compilation of seven churches, God is going to tell us exactly what he feels about the church. And we get a bird's eye view into what he thinks about and his views about the church. So that's why he told John to write to the church. Send this. Put it in a book. Put what I'm about to tell you about the church in the book about the churches and send it to them because I want them to know this. I want them to know my view of the church. I want them to know how I see the church. Doesn't matter how anybody else sees the church. It matters how Christ sees the church. And it also matters 
whether what, whatever your works are, your works should be such that they're acceptable to Christ. Christ doesn't just accept anything, as we're going to see here in this study on the seven churches in Asia Minor. He says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. This is the first one that he writes to is the church of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a place of commerce. It was located in a, in, in, in a very unique place. A lot of trafficking going through there. A lot of false gods and a, the worship of false gods was there. This was a church that Paul had founded. He said, to this church, write these things, saith he. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. This is, this is coming from the one that holds the leadership in his right hand. And he's writing to them. He's writing to them because he wants them to know, number one, I hold you in my right hand. And this is what I view. This is my view. This is what I have to say about what's going on. He said, these, are, these, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He gives us a little revelation there that Jesus Christ walks in the midst or the middle of the church. You think, where is the Lord? He's in the church. He's sitting on high, but he's in the church. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father, but he's in the church. He's in the church. The Spirit of God is in the church. He said, first of all, in verse 2, I know thy works. Do you know that God knows everything you're doing and not doing? And he's writing this to the church to let us know that he knows exactly what your works are. Now listen to this about Ephesus. He said, I know your works and your labors and your patience and how you can't bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and has bore and has patience and for my name's sake have labored and has not fainted. Now, you would think with all of these qualities, because if, as we look at the, the letters sent to the churches, you're going to notice something. The first thing the Lord does is identifies himself. Then he commends them. He tells them, I know your works. And then he commends them about what they're doing right. And he tells the church at Ephesus, in so many words, that you have labors. You're patient. And you can't even bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not and found them to be liars. You have discernment. You have that going for you. And you will bore and has patience for my name's sake. You've borne your burdens. You have patience for my name's sake. And has labored. You're laboring for the Lord. You have not fainted, he says. You have not fainted. Now, with all of that going on, this, these type of works going on, and the Lord commending them on that, you would think that the Lord was pleased with Ephesus. You would think that the Lord was pleased with this church. But then the Lord says something very powerful. And remember, this is the master here. He says, nevertheless, in other words, you've got all this going on, you got labor. You got patience. You, you, you can't stand the evil things. You have discernment. You're bearing your burdens. You're patient. You haven't, you, you haven't fainted. But yet, I still have something against you. I still have somewhat against you. And then he gives the reason why. He says, because thou hast left thy first love. Let me stop here and say this to you today. Does it matter how much you love God? Absolutely. Does it matter whether you serve God with all your heart? The first commandment was what? That you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Your relationship, your love relationship and fellowship with God really matters. It reminds me of what 
God said in Jeremiah 2.2, 2, he said, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothed, when you went after me in the wilderness in the land that was sown. It was a time when Israel went after God. It was a time when they really loved God. It was a time when they would do whatever God wanted them to do. Gladly and rejoice. It was a time when they wanted fellowship with God, when they really loved him and cared about the things of God. But something happened to them and they fell away. Amen. Just like God is telling the church right here, the church at Ephesus, you've left your first love. He tells them, first of all, in verse 5, remember therefore from whence you have fallen. In other words, when you stop loving God the way you're supposed to love God, you're supposed to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. If your relationship with God has grown cold, that's your fault. It's not God's fault. God has not called you to, 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 to fall away. He's called you to love him. He's called you to build a relationship. And if you stick close to God, if you seek God, your love in God will grow. But the farther you get away from God, the colder that love will grow. And a lot of people have left their first love. Remember when you first got saved, you were on fire for God. You didn't care about nothing but serving God in that day. But now all these other things have gotten in the way and God is second or third in your life and your love has grown cold. Does it matter if your love grows cold? Does it matter if you're not, in, if you're not excited about the Lord, in love with the Lord, following the Lord, obeying the Lord like you used to? Does it matter? According to this, it does. And remember, this is a message from the master. Nevertheless, I have someone against you because you left your first love. He said, remember... Therefore, from whence thou art fallen. He says, when you lose your love for God, you're fallen. You're not coming closer. Listen to me. You can have as much of God as you want or as little of God as you want. That's not up to God. It's up to you. You can follow him closely or you can follow him far behind. That's your choice. But God wants a relationship with you. He wants a love relationship, a real relationship with you. He wants your love. He desires your worship. God wants fellowship with you. And does it matter when you grow cold? Oh, absolutely. He says, you've fallen. He told the church, you've fallen. And the next thing he said, repent and do the first work. Repent and go back and recapture what you've lost. Go back and fall in love with God again. Go back and do the things that bring you close to God. Go back and do the things that recapture that experience you had with God, that love you had with God, that passion. You ought to not lose your passion because it matters to God. Here Jesus complains about that to the church at Ephesus. He says, this is what, you got all these other things going for you, but this I got against you. And the thing I have against you is that you left your first love. You don't love me like you used to. You don't love me because if you love God like you used to love him, like you're supposed to love him, you're going to serve him like you're supposed to serve him. But he says that I have someone against you because of that. He tells them to repent, go back, and do the thing over again, go back to their first love. He said, remember where you fall and repent, do the first works over, and then he threatens them. You mean God is threatening somebody? Yes, he is. He certainly is. Notice what he said. He says, repent and do the first works or else. That sounds like a threat. Or else. Or else I will come unto you quickly and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place except you repent. God said to Ephesus, listen, I, what does the candlestick, rec, uh, candlestick represent? The church. He says, if you don't repent, I'll remove the church out of its place. If you don't repent. That is a threat from God. He says in verse 6, But thou hast this, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. Now the Nicolaitans were something else. They had all kinds of doctrines, bad doctrines that they were teaching. Like adultery and fornication were not a sin. And they were okay. They had similar doctrines to that. And God said he hated that. 
And he says, you got this going for you, that you hate what the Nicolaitans stand for, and I hate that thing also. But you've left your first love, and you need to come back. And, 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 and you need to come back. And in verse 7, he ends up saying this. And he that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Notice what he says. To the overcomer. As we study these seven letters to the seven churches, you're going to discover something. That it's only to the overcomers the promises are given. You must overcome. And the only way you're going to overcome is walking with God. You've got to be with Christ. You've got to follow him. You've got to obey his word. You've got to do what God is calling you to do. You need to love God with all that you have. He said, to overcome, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You know that tree of life that was in the book of Genesis? That tree of life, we're going to find out a lot about that tree of life as we go through this study. It's going to be in the millennium. It's going to be in the earth. It's going to be in the new Jerusalem, the tree of life. It's a tree of life. Amen. And so he says, it's in the paradise of God. He said, I will give you to eat if you will come back, if you will, if you will love me, if you will serve me, if you will overcome. You know, we have to overcome that selfishness that is all about us. Let me tell you something today. It ain't all about you. It's all about him. We should be living for him. God says, live for me now. Serve me now. Do my will now, and I will bless you for eternity. There's going to be time to get blessed that way. But now is the time to do the work of God. And he says in verse 8, unto the angel or unto the pastors and elders and leaders of the church of Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last which was dead and is now alive. He identifies himself again. This, in fact, is Jesus. He said, I know your works and tribulation and poverty. Now think about this. This is a poor church. But we're going to discover something as we go into our next telecast about this church. That it doesn't take money to please God. It doesn't take things to please God. It doesn't take material things and wealth to please God. Some think that wealth is what pleases God. Gain is godliness and etc. But we're going to discover here with the church at Smyrna that you don't have to be rich. You don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to have a lot of material wealth to please God, because this church here, Smyrna, is a church that as we study it, you'll discover God has nothing negative to say about it. Not like Ephesus. God doesn't have a complaint about this church, and this is not a rich church. And I just want to read this last part as we are closing out today. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is now alive. I know your works, tribulation, and your poverty. But notice what he says. But thou art rich. You're, 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 you, you're, you have poverty in the church, but you're rich. Because what do they have? They have the true riches. The true riches are not materialism. The true riches are not money. We'll get into what the true riches are. Because the Lord says, you have tribulation and you have, which is a lot of trouble and pressure and, you have, and, and poverty. You have that. But you are rich. You are rich. It doesn't take money to please God. Faith in the word of God. Faith in the son of God. Walking hand in hand. Yoke to Jesus. He said, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. This church here, Smyrna, 
is a church that is doing exactly what God wants it to do. And so far, ask yourself the question, are you in Ephesus or are you in Smyrna? What part of the church are you in? Because if you're in this one, you may be poor, but you're rich. You're rich in the things of God. You're rich in the things of God. He said, and I know the blasphemy of them that say they're Jews and are not, and are of the synagogue of Satan. There were some saying they were Jews, but they were actually worshiping the devil. They were like a cult. And he said, you know who they are. I see them. The Lord says, I see them. He said, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. You see, one thing the Lord points out to us here is that he knows what's going on in the church. You know, this is no mystery to him. Where is he? He said, I stand right in the midst of the golden candlesticks. I'm right there. Got, got the leaders in my hand, the seven stars. And he said, I know exactly what's going on in the church. I know your works. I know the good things you're doing. I know the things that you're doing according to my will. I know all those things. But I also know when you're not doing it. And let me ask you a question today. Does God have somewhat against you? Does God have some things you're doing that you should not be doing? Well, this is a message for the, from the master. If you mess up, repent. Repentance can stop judgment. We'll talk about that pretty soon. Repentance can stop judgment, and God can restore you in the name of Jesus. So join us again on our messenger broadcasts. We'll be looking to see you as we study the word of God and we search the scriptures to unveil the truths of God, to reveal them in the name of Jesus. This is Pastor Mark Banks pastor of Holy Spirit Church. Come out and visit us. God bless you. See you soon.